What is up, YouTube? We are back for day four of Advent of Code 2021 in Rust. You'll notice I am indeed wearing a different outfit. Went for more of a lumberjack vibe today. Someone said keep the jacket, so maybe we'll just make the jacket every day. You know, it feels kind of Christmassy, at least for us people living in the Midwest where we get a lot of snow. Anyways, let's solve day four. Day four is pretty much just bingo as the game goes. And your input looks something like this. You get a bunch of moves. And then after the moves, you get a bunch of boards. Boards are just basically, they're just basically a list of numbers separated by spaces and you have rows and columns. You win bingo if you either have uh, one of the columns all filled out or one of all the rows filled out i think in real bingo you can also do diagonals and there's a free space but apparently squid bingo is a little different or whatever the name of this game actually is so that's pretty much the whole puzzle for day one they just basically say hey can you find out uh which board wins and then when you find out which board wins you have to uh find all of the numbers that haven't been marked and then multiply the number that was called times those numbers together, you get the answer. So this one's kind of interesting because there's sort of two things that we need to be able to keep track of. One of them is that we just need to be able to keep track of which board's going to win. And then the other thing is we're looking to have some quick way of knowing like what things are left on the board once we're done. So let's go ahead and get to the solve. We'll come back to this part in a second, but as always, we'll go down to our uh, main function. We'll work through how we're going there. So we read the string. This one's a little bit different than before because we have to read the first line differently than the other ones. So I used uh, include string, which is a really nice little macro that basically just finds this file relative to this file that you're currently in and loads it in as a string and it compiles it in, which is pretty nice for this kind of thing. And then we can use the lines iterator to iterate over each of the lines separately. Something that's cool about this is that we can store this as a mute variable. And then what we can actually do is we can just say lines.next. And what this does is it literally like takes the first line and it moves it out of the iterator. And now you have this uh, saved somewhere else. And so when we use lines down here, it's already been passed that first line. So this is kind of a cool way. Oh no, my goodness. Slag notification, embarrassing. Oh my goodness, we're gonna leave it in. That's what Prime does too, right? So I'll just leave it in. Uh, anyways, we uh, we get to the next line and we use it inside of here, okay? So the first line, if you recall, is basically just a bunch of numbers split by commas. So we are also going to split those by commas, parse them as I32s and then just collect them up. So now we've got our list or our vector of different moves. The next part that we need to do is we need to get a list of the different possible boards. Um, I used this little pattern matching thing within a while loop. This is a cool trick. I guess it's not really a trick. It's just a language feature that I've used quite a bit lately of using ifs and whiles and uh, lets sort of combined together to do a pattern matching here. And this while statement will continue to go so long as this matches the pattern. So this is really cool because this will only keep going in this while loop while I have a valid board. And so as soon as this board new returns none, then this loop will stop. So we push all the boards into this board. How does board new work? Short answer is, and this is where actually a little bit of, you could choose different ways to store the data here, but I chose to do it this way. And I think it's at least a pretty optimal way to solve the problem is I actually have a, a vector of sets of the possible moves here. So you might be thinking, well, TJ, don't you need to like keep track of what row or anything like that? No, I don't. I actually don't need to keep it each of those individually because we're only concerned with whether you won and what remain. And so bingo boards are guaranteed to only have a number once per board. So we know that basically any number is unique. So we don't have to track like, oh, I already added three, but that was from spot or index like one, one and not two, three or something like that. That's not a concern for bingo. So we, uh, we iterate over the lines. One thing you can do here that's pretty cool is use this take. Uh, this works on iterators and it basically just grabs the next five items. So then we can map each of the next five items by splitting. And then we map basically by 
calling uh, parse on these lines, which will just turn them into U or I32s again. And then we've got a vector. So now basically each of the rows looks, so rows looks like, um, you know, 7, 13, 22, 2, 1. And then we'd have another row of different numbers, 3, 5, 10, 9, 8, et cetera, right? Until we've got all five of them here. And this is a complete board worth of rows. But here's where the trick is. Instead of actually storing this, right, we're actually going to store hash sets or just sets, basically, if you're using a different language, that uh, that store the winning combinations of numbers, okay? So basically what we're going to do is we're going to go, like, down this column here, and we're going to grab seven, three, whatever the other three numbers are. We're going to make a little set of that, and then we'll add another set and another set and another set and another set. Then we do this row wise as well. So another possible set of winning numbers is 7, 13, 22, 2, 1. So this makes it much faster than it would be before because now we don't actually have to iterate over every board's each index. We can actually just iterate over their hash sets and remove a number when we're done. Uh, so that's, that's sort of what's going on in new. And then we just return some board full of sets. Okay, so now we've got our list of boards. We got all those our boards, right? For the first problem, all we need to do is find the first winning board and then get the remaining sum. So how do I do that? Basically, I'm iterating over all the moves in order. And then I'm iterating over the boards. I'm mutating the boards by taking a turn. You could, I guess, instead return a new board, but I didn't think that that was useful to do. And what a turn does is it asks whether this board is complete after the turn is done. And so that's that's what each one of these boards will do each turn or for each move, basically. Right. So we're going to have a move. We're going to do this for each of the boards. You call a turn. As soon as one of them is complete, we're going to print out what our value is. So how does this work? We get each of the sets. And because we're going to change the set. Right. Remember, before we had added these sets of like seven, three, twenty two, two, one. We added a set. That's a possible winning combination. We're actually just going to remove we're going to remove that number whatever the move option is here and then after we remove it we're going to check if the set is empty and this is actually or equals so if one of these is true if any one of these is true then we're going to say that it's complete and then we'll return complete okay and we need to do it this way and not return early because uh, a number could be referenced in multiple different sets. So we need to make sure that we've basically completely eliminated that number from the set of values. Okay. So then once we do that, if any of the boards match, then we just print this val this, whatever this move was times the remaining sum. And the remaining sum is basically just, we get a set of the numbers. We iterate but we do this by iterating over the sets contained in our board and flattening them. So flatten pretty much if you had some list and you had like a set of one, two, three, and then you had uh, like two, three, four like this. If you did this, this would turn into the flatten actually pull sort of all of these guys together. So it'd be like one, two, three, two, three, four. But of course, when we make a set, what it's actually going to do is turn that into one, two, three, four. Okay. And then we're going to, uh, we're going to just basically take the sum of these to get the value here that will give us whatever's left. This is the same thing as writing this iterate over the sets, extend the sets and then sum them. But you all know, you can type it in the comments. One-liners are cool for AOC, okay? Everyone just type it in the comments. One-liners are cool for AOC. Yes, okay, okay. So that's part one. Part two, part two is somewhat similar. It's similar in a lot of ways, except for part two, you're looking to find the last board that will win. And then you wanna do the same thing. Okay, so this time, in, like I said, it's very similar, except instead of stopping on the first one, we're gonna keep going till we get to the last one. So this one's a bit more complicated because we don't want to change the list of boards that we have as we're iterating over it. So we just keep track of which boards we need to remove. We do basically the same logic here. There's nothing new happening with board.turn. And we keep track of what the last result was. So this last result is basically the answer to part two by doing the same calculation, m times the board.remaining sum. 
And then we just push what index we need to remove. So as we're iterating over the moves, we're mutating boards. We're mutating the boards, right? And we're removing whatever index it is that uh, has completed. This way we don't have to keep on calculating things for those boards once they're done. We don't care anymore. They've already won. One trick for this though is you need to make sure you do this in reverse. If you don't do this in reverse, you're gonna be mutating less and the indexes that you had before might not be valid anymore. For example, if you had two boards win in the same move, then this won't work anymore. So that's it. That's part one and part two. Main things that I think are kind of interesting here are these ideas of, this is sort of just a syntax construct that you might like quite a bit using in Rust. I think uh, this while or if let some, I use this quite often. I think it's pretty elegant. I like how pattern matching sort of extends to a bunch of different places. And then... Oh, right. The other cool bit, I think, is just the data structure that we chose of instead of using just the rows and iterating over all the rows, we can just remove very quickly by keeping track of the sets. I suppose one possible optimization that I didn't write because this runs really, really fast would be you could have something here that was like all possible numbers. And so you could say like nums and you could just make another hash set of I32s here. And if you did this, then you could check if a number even exists inside of a board when you're going to take a turn instead of uh, like having to check each of the boards each time. So you could just short circuit here like if self.nums uh, contains m, whoops, m, then uh, return false or something like this, right? So you could do this instead. Okay, this would also work, and this would probably be slightly faster. You'd just have to remember to make, you'd have to construct these numbs here. But I didn't do that just because it felt really fast already, and I didn't think I got a lot of, I thought it sort of obfuscated what I was doing generally with this part of sets. So anyways, that's day four. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you enjoyed the code. If you like the code, leave a comment. If you don't like the code, leave a comment. But no matter what, of course, smash the sub button, smash the like, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. <laughs> I hope you guys have a great day and have fun doing Advent of Code or just learning. See ya.